Hey everyone, and welcome to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're going to be diving into episodes 529 through 531, which will cover manga chapters 610 through 612. And the pieces in the Fishman Island arc are beginning to be put in place to set up the rest of the story and potentially for the rest of the series. So, synopsis. After finding a way to save Sanji, and while he recovers, the remaining Straw Hats begin exploring the rest of Fishman Island, guided by Kami and Papug, until they are found by none other than the King of Fishman Island himself, who has invited him over to his palace. On the other hand, the main villain, Hody Jones, begins to make his moves against the rest of our heroes. All right, so differences. There are a few differences. Uh, there's a, a couple of scenes that are shuffled around for pacing and also to be able to fit into some of the episodes so that they end on the right moments. But here are some of the bigger changes. So the beginning of episode 529 is different in two ways. In the manga, this is the point where it just cuts straight to Sanji waking up from his blood transfusion. However, the anime adds a little extra scene of them struggling to find a donor as well as that scene i mentioned in the past podcast episode of the mermaid stumbling upon caribou's barrel which i mentioned is supposed to occur just before hody jones's silhouetted appearance and so that is also placed here as well in the anime we also get a couple filler scenes about the straw hats and where they are and how they came to be where they are so we get a brief scene of pup bug recalling how he ran into brook in the anime which is something we don't see in the manga There's another uh, brief added scene of Sanji struggling in bed, picturing Splash and Splatter. Uh, This was also not in the anime or manga as well. Another scene that was changed was the scene of Pupbug and Kami explaining what the Ryugu Palace is and then asking Neptune if Kami and Pupbug can come with them to the banquet is added in the anime. And in the manga, as soon as we get that shot of everyone freaking out that Neptune was inviting them to the palace, we cut to Hody going after Gyro. And then we don't catch back up with Luffy and the gang for a couple more scenes, by which point they've already left for the palace and are on their way there. Another change is when Hody comes crashing through the deck of Gyro's ship in his sort of first initial attack. The anime, we see the person sitting on the spot where Hody comes crashing out of, in in his initial attack, he just gets kind of flung up in the air. But in the manga, if you look at that panel, you actually see Hody straight up just bites down on this guy's torso, presumably killing him, which is probably why they edited this scene and censored it to a little less violent of an action. Those are pretty much the major ones that I found. So to start off, I'm going to start off on a bit of a, a negative note, I guess I could say. Because I can't take the serious nature and tone of the the way these scenes are directed seriously because of how stupid the circumstances were that led up to needing this transfusion and then them looking for the donor. But they do manage to find a donor in a pair of Okama pirates named Splash and Splatter. But what's annoying about this scene is Sanji just freaks out and doesn't even thank them. Like, he he could have at least thanked them even after he freaked out, but nope. This is just a straight L from Sanji here. Like, Sanji was about to die here. Like, for real, he was going to die. And I don't really care who donated the blood. It saved his life. And the absolute least he could have done was show some gratitude. But anyways, moving on from that crappy character moment to something that was actually really cool was the revelation that Luffy has a certain level of poison immunity. Like, what?! So it's revealed that Luffy was pricked by Hyozo's blue-ringed octopus venom during their encounter and sustained a deadly amount of poisoning, but he was virtually unaffected because of the immunity to poison he's developed from the beating he took from Magellan all the way back in Impel Down. And I love that bit of continuity and the fact that he now has this awesome ability because you know that this will come back to play a bigger role and a more critical role later on in the story. And I love how when Luffy remembers back to that moment, it looks like he's reminiscing on it like it was a fun memory, but like <laughs> he almost died there too. And it, it's kind of funny how just like how you see Luffy's mind work because he, he seems to reminisce about it almost like it was it was a nostalgic memory. From here, we get introduced to a fairly impactful and important new character named Madame Charlie, the owner of the Mermaid Cafe and fortune teller. Now, Madam Charlie is a voice most everyone who's into anime, at least in the past 25 plus years, has heard. 
She is voiced by the very talented Romy Park, and she usually plays very cool and distant characters. Some of her more notable roles are like Tao Ren from Shaman King, Temari from Naruto, Pakunodo from Hunter x Hunter, and more recently, Zoe Hange from Attack on Titan, as well as Star and Stripe from My Hero Academia. But her two most famous roles, and my favorite ones, are easily、uh, Hitsugaya Toshiro from Bleach and Edward Elric from both versions of Full Metal Alchemist, the original one, and Brotherhood. So, yes, she is a legend in the anime voice acting community. And you can definitely hear both、uh, Hitsugaya and Edward in the, in the way she portrays、uh, Madame Charlie, too. Now, Madame Charlie is a very interesting character and is a very central one to one of the bigger mysteries of the entire series. As we see later in this episode with her fortune, despite her not wanting to see into the future anymore, she still inadvertently or kind of her curiosity gets the better of her and she sees another fortune. Now, when this character was first introduced along with her ability to see into the future, I was very afraid that One Piece was going to start using the tired trope of the chosen one that you often see. In stories a lot these days. I'm not saying that it's inherently bad, like Harry Potter and The Matrix being great examples of it working well, but at the same time, it's kind of a played out trope as we saw it in like the Star Wars prequels and many, many other stories. However, it turns out n- not to be the case as the prophecy does center on Luffy, but it's not a straight up chosen one prophecy, but one that on the surface actually kind of spells out something terrible. And I want to talk more about this prophecy, but it does actually lead to a direct spoiler for the end of this arc. So I'm actually going to save a lot of that conversation for the spoiler section. But we do see that she gets a prophecy of Luffy being the one to annihilate the Fishman Island, which is a very interesting prophecy because to us, the viewer, there's no potential way that we could have ever seen. Luffy destroying Fishman Island or anything like that, unless he had a reason to, like a good reason. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. However, one thing the anime changes about the way this scene is portrayed is how instead of just the silhouette that's shown in the manga, it ambiguously shows Luffy,、uh, but it's more like a s- person with a straw hat on who has the same body type as Luffy. Like, it- it's pretty much Luffy. But I bring this up because at the time in the manga, some people, including myself, thought there was a possibility that maybe one way this could be misinterpreted is she just said someone in a straw hat, not necessarily Luffy. So we thought maybe it could have been a red herring and it could be someone else entirely that maybe had a similar silhouette as Luffy. But when this episode aired, it pretty much confirmed that yes, this prophecy is in fact talking, talking specifically about Luffy. Once Luffy, Usopp, and Kami catch up with Brooke and Pug Pug, they see Vanderdecken's、uh, wanted poster. And Brooke again is shown to recognize him and calls him a ghost. But the fact that Brooke knows who Vanderdecken is always made me wonder how old is this dude? And why is this ancient man trying to court a princess who's still underage?、Uh, that was also a funny thing. But this scene kind of clears that up immediately. We learn that he is, in fact, not the same Vanderdecken that Brooke knows, but is his descendant, Vanderdecken the Ninth. Oh, one translator's note during this explanation from Pop Pug he keeps getting interrupted, and there's a quick, insignificant wordplay joke that's kind of lost in translation here. It really isn't that big of a deal at all, but I still like to point it out because I personally enjoy them. So Pop Pug yells out to listen to me. After growing frustrated, people keep interrupting him and no one paying attention to him, which is a running joke that happens throughout all of Pup Pug's、uh, appearances. So, in Japanese, he actually yells out, Hitode no hanashi wo kike, which literally translates to listen to the starfish's story. But this plays on the same wordplay that I mentioned all the way back in several、uh, episodes when Pup Pug was first introduced back on Sabodi, where starfish in Japanese is Hitode. And the beginning of hito de is hito, which is person or people. So he likes to replace hito with hito de. And he does it here again with a very common Japanese phrase that you'll often hear in anime and just in just regular conversation when no one is paying attention to them, which is usually hito no hanashi o kike, where he just replaces hito with hito de.、Uh, 
now <laughs> I know that's a very insignificant joke, but I always I always get a little chuckle out of it every time he uses that. Also from Pug Pug, we get to learn some interesting bits of information concerning the fallout from the Paramount War and Whitebeard being killed. It was mentioned by Jinbei that with Whitebeard gone, he was worried for the safety of Fishman Island as it was being protected by Whitebeard's influence. But it looks like in that time, at least in the two years time skip, another Yonko emperor stepped in to fill that void, albeit for somewhat more personal gain. And that emperor was Big Mom. And in return for her protection, they have to provide her with a huge amount of sweets. And this is only the second mention of Big Mom since she was first introduced along with the whole concept of the Yonkos back at the end of Water 7 by Garp. All we had was a vague silhouette of a huge and ugly woman and the name Big Mom, which painted the picture of a pirate similar to kind of how I imagined or I saw Alvida, but even bigger. And now with this new revelation that she demands a huge amount of sweets, it paints a, the picture of a huge and gluttonous pirate. And we will eventually get to see Big Mom in some, at some point in this arc, but not till the end. But we get to see her Jolly Roger and also learn her real name is Charlotte Linlin. Now one thing about the translations and the sub for this is that they display her name as Big Mam. As in M-A-M instead of the correct Big Mom as in M-O-M. But this is one's not really on the translators as Oda seems to have made this mistake himself. As in chapter 610, you can clearly see he illustrates Big Mom's Jolly Roger with uh, a title across it that says Big Mam over it. But the anime sidesteps this at, at least by not having the written name above the Jolly Roger. This is due to the fact that in Japanese, in order to get that ma sound in mom, you have to use the ma ma katakana character. And so you get this weird ma and mom all both having that. And then when you go to translate it, it gets mistranslated. I do like that Luffy potentially thinks that maybe she's a good guy like Whitebeard. I don't think it's much of a spoiler to tell you that this is not the case. <laughs> she is definitely not a good guy. Although, I will say, and again, this may be a little bit bordering on spoiler territory, but I think Big Mom had the potential to be a good person. But we'll talk about that far later when we actually get to the arc where she is the main villain. But moving on, in episode 530, we're finally formally introduced to the main villain of the arc, Hody Jones, and his crew, who all look pretty freaky in their own right. They definitely look more otherworldly and scary looking than how Oda designed Arlong's crew, especially Daruma, who is, of course, named for being this very small, round fishman that looks similar to a Daruma doll. But his frenzied look and manic way of speaking is creepy as hell. And I've always liked the look of Zeo. And I don't really know why, but I just do. He just looks badass and cool. And in the manga, we get title cards for each of Hody's officers, but we only get it for Hody in the anime. And and we just get to hear Ikaros' name. But in addition to him, like I mentioned earlier, the small freaky one that wants to rip flesh off of humans is Daruma. The striped one, who is the Wabagong shark, is Zeo. And the hammerhead shark, a one, is Dosun. And to round out the officers who's not with them here because he's out in the field is Hyozo the octopus. Now for this crew, Oda definitely focused on composing them of more scary sea creatures of either sharks or cephalopods like Hyozo being an octopus, Ikaros being a squid. Oda plays on our innate general fear of these two types of sea creatures to add a bit more kick to his villain's intimidation factors here. And all their names are, are interesting. Like the Dosun, who's the hammerhead shark, his name basically comes from the fact that like when you hammer something down, it makes this Dosun. Like Dosun is actually an automatopoeia for like when you slam something down. Uh, Zeo, I'm not actually sure where that one comes from. Ikaros is his, uh, the beginning part of his name, Ika, is squid in Japanese. And then obviously Daruma is probably called Daruma because of his shape and design being close to a Daruma doll. Now speaking of Hody and his crew, let's talk about the other interesting addition to this arc and these villains. And this is something I never thought I'd see in One Piece, which is performance enhancing drugs. I was kind of taken aback at, at the moment when this came out because it seems so close to the real world, especially as a baseball fan myself. 
that grew up in the 90s <laughs> with the whole Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa like steroid era. It kind of took me out of the fantasy of One Piece and broke my immersion a little bit. I was like, really, Oda? You're going with steroids as the main gimmick for these villains? <laughs> to me, this just seemed so out of place and weird. Now, to be fair, this isn't the first instance of performance-enhancing substance in One Piece. Like, back in Arabasta, we saw the, the hero water grant those four warriors enhanced strength, but that version was far more extreme as it basically killed them in like 5 to 10 minutes after consuming it at the cost uh, of great um, strength. And while I'm still not the biggest fan of the energy steroids, in hindsight, I do understand what Oda was going for and the deeper meaning behind what it represents, which I do like. And we'll, of course, get more into that as we see the energy steroids being used throughout this arc and how it affects its users, particularly Hody and his crew. Also a bit of a history lesson, I suppose. One other thing I want to mention is that in some early translations of Hody's name, particularly when this arc was being released at the time, was that sometimes you saw Hody's name translated as Hordy, as in, for some reason, so if you see that around, just know that that was just a mistake in fan translations at the time. All the official translations nowadays get it right with Hody. I think one reason why that mistranslation came about is because in Japanese, the way Hody is written, you have to have that elongated character Ho, which led many people to think it was Hordi because of that long elongated Ho part. Because there's no real way to indicate the R sound if you were trying to go for Hordi. And so many people expected Hodi to be written and pronounced without the elongation as just Hodi. Without the the bar, because in the Japanese you'll see the the character the katakana character for ho, and then you see this bar which tells you to elongate the ho, and then you'd have the d, and so you would say it hori in Japanese. So many people often thought maybe it was translated as hori, so you'd have that r to kind of take the place of the lo- elongated bar. Because if you if it was just hori, then you would just have the no bar. But that also sounds weird in Japanese. And so there was that confusion. But officially, his name is Hody, as in just H-O-D-Y without the R. Once we get back to the crew, they run into Nami doing her usual unreasonable bargaining for clothes. But Papag, as the owner, grants her anything she wants for free. And then in a hilarious fashion, she shows no mercy and clears out the entire place enlisting Luffy, Usopp, and Brooke to carry out massive sacks of products. And I found this scene pretty funny as it's probably one of the most extreme Nami shopping scenes. But just then the whole square is in a bit of commotion as the king of Fishman Island descends from the sky. And this is our first look at King Neptune, who is obviously named after the Roman god of the sea of the same name as he chants his trademark ending to sentences Jamong. And as far as I can tell, Jamong isn't really a reference to anything, nor is it an actual word or phrase in Japanese. The best thing I can come up with is kind of hinted with Luffy's little comment, actually, as one of the first things Luffy observes about Neptune is that in addition to saying he's huge, that he's also very hairy. And in Japanese, how you say it is by saying they're moja moja. And if you reverse moja, you get jamo and jamo. And so maybe what Oda was referencing is the fact that he wanted to get this hairy man to say he's jamo or moja. Um, That's my best stretch. I don't even know if that's right. I've never actually been able to confirm where the whole jamo thing comes from. Of course, it could just be... Uh, uh, you know, uh, a quirk that a ca- each character has when they when it, when it comes to like their laugh or the way they say their sentences. Like one example is Mister Three or Galdino when he finishes his sentences. Dagane. Um, that's not really a thing. That's pretty much just for Mister um, Three. Or you know, Naruto is another a good example from a non One Piece character how he ends his sentences as Tatebayo. Um, so yeah, it could just be a. a fun speech quirk that he gives his characters. Neptune's design is very reminiscent of how most undersea gods are depicted, whether it be Poseidon the Greek god, or Neptune the Roman god, or even King Triton from The Little Mermaid, often with long flowy hair and huge beards with a trident. But he's here to invite them to the palace, presumably for saving Megalo the shark, and for being friends with Jinbei. And this is one of those moments where we see Toei really extend this scene out unnecessarily long, with these long silent shots 
of facial reactions for no reason really other than to build unnecessary tension that was never present in the manga and it's frankly annoying and unfortunately this is the beginning of the practice of adding these crazy long reaction shots that One Piece's anime has become infamous for to draw episodes and to drag pacing down. And this is why fan projects like One Piece of manually editing down the length of these episodes uh, basically from the post time skip era became very popular and unfortunately it will continue to get worse every arc from here on out. Cutting away to another scene with Hody's attack on the gyro pirates, this scene serves us to tell us the audience how the energy steroid works and it basically just exponentially doubles the power of the consumer of the pill at the cost of a shortened lifespan and for each pill it basically doubles their power and then it just exponentially grows from there with each pill that you consume. Now going from one villain intro to another we finally get to see what became of the mermaids that found caribou's barrel and the poor unwitting mermaids do try to open it and see what's hidden inside it only to come to the horrible realization that they made a terrible mistake as he begins to engulf them in what we learn are his swamps using his Numa Numa no Mi or the Swamp Swamp Fruit. Numa is just swamp in Japanese, but whenever I hear Numa Numa no Mi, I just immediately think of that Romanian song Drago Starinte by Ozone that was hugely viral back when I was in high school. And it's kind of a meme still to this day, sometimes even referred to as the Numa Numa song for its lyrics. <laughs> I love that song, by the way. The, the Numa Numa no Mi is pretty unique compared to most other Logia Devil Fruits for two reasons. One is that while he is able to become liquid, it seems like it's far more solid due to the high viscosity of the swamp matter. And perhaps due to that, he's unable to reform himself if he's trapped in a space smaller than his body. And this is actually very reminiscent of a non-canon Logia Fruit from the second movie, Clockwork Island Adventure. And spoilers for that movie, by the way. But one of the villains of the Trump pirate crew, Honey Queen, had the Toro Toro no Mi, or the ability to turn into some unknown liquid, and is defeated by Nami at the end by trapping her in a jar and taping it shut. And so, yeah, those, th those situations are very similar. Also, a quick note, Toro Toro is just the onomatopoeia for like the sound of something, uh, a thick liquid um, flowing. The second fairly unique quality this Logia has that we've only seen in one other fruit is the ability to suck people and things into some sort of a pocket dimension and hold people and things indefinitely like Blackbeard's Yami Yami no Mi. And when you really sit and think about those that get sucked up by the swamp or in, in Blackbeard's case, his darkness, it's pretty horrifying. Like in Blackbeard's case, it's really scary because you're still conscious while you're stuck in this void. And I, I don't know how you don't go insane being stuck in there for too long. And in fact, you, we do see that in Impel Down when he sucks people up and then spits them back out. You hear some of those Marine officers just traumatized by their experience inside the darkness. At least with Caribou, he, he, he mentions the fact that they get put to sleep. And so they're unconscious while they're in there. So at least they're not like mentally anguished. But Caribou's actions in turn leads the royal guards to suspect the Straw Hats of being the ones to abduct the mermaids. Even in the face of no evidence and even some testimony from people defending the Straw Hats. And you can clearly see sort of the prejudice that fish people have towards humans rearing its head. And this thread of the Straw Hats being viewed differently by different people will be a big theme in this arc and perhaps for the entire story really. As we see, like, some people are very apprehensive about the Straw Hats because of their experience of people coming in and abducting mermaids and, and sort of having that history. We also get a filler scene that explains Frankie and Robin's absence, which was not necessary since the only need for it arose because of the added filler scene from before of them actually being regrouped with Nami. Now, one thing when I originally read through Fishman Island for the first time that I didn't consider until it was actually mentioned was that this place, you know, meant something to Frankie considering that Tom was a fishman and that he might have had family or friends here. So I'm glad that Oda didn't forget about this little detail and had Frankie basically try and find Tom's family. Robin, of course, is following up on the lead about the poneglyphs for, this, uh, for the mention of the second ancient weapon Poseidon and its location from back at the end of Skypiea. And while it didn't specifically mention Fishman Island by name, since Robin didn't actually read everything out loud to us or the Shandians, 
we all deduce though that at it would point to Fishman Island since Poseidon is the Greek god of the sea. The next scene also we get some really interesting world lore from Neptune and the addition of another mystery to the story and that is the subject of the sunlight tree Eve which we learn is what allows for the existence of Fishman Island due to the sunlight that the Eve tree gives off. It somehow transfers and emits the sunlight from the surface all the way to the sea floor. Additionally, it also respirates the oxygen at this level as well. And obviously the first thing that comes to mind for those of us One Piece nerds is the connection between this Eve tree and the other famous trees that we've heard of in One Piece, specifically the treasure tree, Adam, the same tree where Frankie got the wood needed to build the Thousand Sunny. And there's already the crazy connection between its partner tree making a ship called the Thousand Sunny and the Eve tree literally being the sun for the undersea land. And Usopp even brings this up uh, as he references this connection in story. There's also the obvious biblical connection between the two trees being a reference to the famous story of Adam and Eve, the first two humans who ate from the forbidden tree of knowledge. Now, how this ties into the trees is unknown, and much of both trees is left pretty much unknown as well. Now, there's a third wrinkle in all of this, too, as it relates to that same biblical story. The Tree of Knowledge also exists in One Piece, which we saw back at the center of what used to be Ohara, where the forbidden fruit was basically the knowledge of the ancient kingdom and the Poneglyphs. Now, some fans have even theorized that due to the forbidden fruit story that these trees are where the first devil fruits came from and what and that is actually a theory i I really like and i kind of hope that that's true the other thing that is always on many fans minds is when it comes to the eve tree is where does the top actually end up some people think that it's embedded inside the red line given its close proximity but i think it has to actually sprout all the way up through the top or else how would it get the sunlight to transfer It potentially may be where or what Marijua is built on top of. And, you know, you see all that green near the Pangaea Castle. Maybe that is all literally the top of the tree. Another theory that Usopp even kind of hints at by mentioning that the Eve tree is kind of like the Yarukimaman groves. And that maybe that Sabodi Archipelago itself is the top of the Eve tree. But in any case, right now with so few clues, it's really hard to determine one way or the other. But I imagine these trees will come into play at some point towards the end of the story. Now that we've talked a good deal about trees, let's move on with the story as the Straw Hats make it to Ryugu Palace finally. And I love how Pup Pug this whole time is being trolled by Brooke. (laughs) Particularly how completely uncalled for it was for him to just disrespect Pup Pug's mansion as nothing compared to this palace, which of course, how could it? (laughs) But Brooke just completely keeps jabbing Pup Pug. Poor guy though. But I I find it hilarious. Now, once we get inside the palace, something that you know that I love about Oda's writing style is how economical it is. And here in the characterization of Neptune and how, you know, we get to see how maybe how he rules as it's first and foremost played for laughs as he's being scolded by his ministers, Sadaijin and Udaijin or minister of left uh, and the minister of the right for going out on his own. And one thing this shows about Neptune as a ruler is that he's very similar to Cobra uh, from Arabasta in that he's kind and just as a king and he lets his subjects have the freedom to do their jobs and respect them enough to allow them to speak their voice without fear of retribution similar to how like Igaram, Chaka and Pell would scold Cobra when he did something ill-advised and, and they would scold him and yell at him for that and Cobra would you know cower and fear a little bit but that was of course all done in in, res- in out of love and respect and Cobra knows that and you can really see how much trust he he instills in both Igaram and Chaka and Pell. And you see that similarly with Sadaijin and Udaijin. Now the final scene of these episodes, it, you kind of see Oda having his sort of perverted nature come out as he has Luffy kind of inadvertently fondle the boobs of Princess Shirahoshi in the dark. Of course, this was an accident on Luffy's part because it was completely dark and Luffy was hungry and confused. But it is kind of weird watching this, especially knowing that Shirahoshi is still only like 16 years old, despite the fact that she's like the size of a five-story building. According to her Vibrant card data, she's actually about 12 meters tall, which is 
I I feel like that's shorter than I thought she would have been based on like her size compared to everyone else. But yeah, she is based off the giant smelt whiting's fish, and her name Shirahoshi most likely comes from the Japanese whiting being called the uh, Shirogisu, and the Shira combined with the naming convention from the from what Neptune uses for all his children, ending in Hoshi or star, creating Shirahoshi. And I think it's Shira instead of Shiro. Because Shiro kind of sounds like a more masculine name in Japanese, so it's named, it's changed a little bit to a more feminine Shira, getting Shira Hoshi. And that is where these episodes end. And I know I haven't really gone into Shira Hoshi too much, despite this being her formal introduction. We're going to save that for the next podcast episode, as she deserves a lot more attention since her role in the story is quite an important one and a very huge one. And so, yeah, I want to give Shira Hoshi a bit more time. To talk without having to split her introduction between the end of this one and the beginning of the next podcast. So, yeah, we'll save Shira Hoshi for the next episode. But if you did enjoy this, send me a like or comment. And if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece, please consider subscribing. Check out my Instagram and Twitter account at Sunny Go Podcast for updates when I post new episodes. And as always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time out to listen to my podcast. And I just recently figured out how to read my reviews. And um, yeah, I really appreciate some of the kind words that people have left in in particularly Apple Podcasts. And so, yeah, I really wanted to thank you all. I know there was one review that asked if I would do like another series, uh, whether it be like Jujutsu Kaisen or Naruto or something else. Maybe, but One Piece is still ongoing and it already takes up a lot of time. And so I don't know that I could do another series. Plus, while I do love other series, I don't know that I know them as well enough to be able to do a podcast like this for them. Perhaps maybe Naruto would be the the next best one. I think that's maybe the one that I I like the most and know the most about, but I still not to the level that I kind of am obsessed with one piece so but yeah we'll see if one piece ever ends and and i you know run out of things to talk about here but i do really appreciate all the kind words so thank you very much and thanks for all your support but yeah stay safe out there and i hope to see you on the next episode bye Alrighty, so spoiler section. This is going to be a fairly short one as I just have one thing I wanted to talk about and that's regarding the prophecy. And again, this is mostly going to be unscripted. Now, I think most people in the community agree that while it will probably come true, it won't come true the way it's initially described as if it's a prophecy that has been kind of misinterpreted in a way. That while on the surface it may seem like Luffy is going to bring about the destruction of Fishman Island, it will either not be the case or only look like that, or that he will actually bring about the destruction, but that in fact is actually a good thing for everyone. And so, yeah, it's it's interesting to see how this prophecy will play out because the, it's teased that the prophecy is referring to Luffy maybe bringing down Noah at the end and basically him being the one that smashes all the pieces of Noah and then that comes crashing down into Fishman Island. Now it's teased that that but obviously that's not the case because the the story ends with Shirahoshi unlocking her Poseidon powers and ha- having this the the Sea Kings basically stop Noah from crashing down. Now there has always been this long thought that or long held theory that eventually Fishman Island will actually be destroyed because they will be allowed to live up in on the surface with humans. And that's kind of the ideal ending to the whole Fishman Island story as well as Jinbei's dream. And so I think it will actually happen, but I'm interested to see how that will actually play out because obviously Madame Charlie only saw a little bit of it and a very like obscured view of of that prophecy playing out i mean from our view and i don't know if this is actually what madame charlie saw but from our view we just see a silhouette of luffy engulfed in flames and so that doesn't really tell us anything um but yeah i think that it's a very interesting prophecy in the sense that well what does that actually mean especially now that the revelation and this is spoilers up until chapter 1117 which is what we just read 
uh, this past week uh, that I'm recording this. But with the whole revelation that the, the sea is rising, it'll be interesting to see maybe how that will play into whether what actually ends up happening, whether the sea will actually rise and basically engulf the world, meaning that everyone will have to come down and live in, t- in the ocean and, and thereby the whole connecting is all the water is basically engulfing all the land. So now fishmen and humans basically have to live amongst each other. The other thing is maybe that the ending to One Piece is that it'll reverse the flooding that has basically occurred. And so thereby combining the the land back together and so thereby kind of destroying fishman island because obviously there's not really there's going to be a far less water but then everybody will be be able to live together so yeah there's a couple ways that this could go about i don't think there will actually be a situation where luffy just straight up just starts physically pounding on fishman island and destroying it with his powers or something like that um but who knows? Yeah, this is a very interesting prophecy that I don't really know too much about how it'll go. Because then you have things like Uranus that is capable of destroying islands. So potentially that might have to be something. The other long-held theory that people have is that at some point in order for the story to conclude and for the world to be connected is for the red line to be destroyed. And since Fishman Island is basically at the base of the red line, that it will be a... Um, collateral damage from the red line being destroyed and the one to destroy the red line could potentially be Luffy and so he might inadvertently destroy Fishman Island but in in the end it will actually be a good thing for the whole world including the Fishmen for the red line and Marichua to be destroyed and brought down so yeah there's a lot of ways this prophecy could go it's very interesting to kind of like sit there and think about and, and, and kind of kind of put all the clues together but yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to really talk about. I'm not really much of a theory crafter. Most of these are just theories that I've read and heard from people on Reddit and YouTube and Twitter and stuff like that. Um, I think for me, I've always thought that maybe that Fishman Island will break because of the whole red line thing. That's kind of been my personal thought as well. And I I also kind of thought about that but even before I, I started seeing all the theories on, on the internet. And so, yeah, that's kind of where my mind goes. But anyways, thanks for listening to me ramble on about that. And uh, I hope to see you on the next episode. See ya.